As the gap between Rome and the reformers grew, attempts were made, consciously and unconsciously, to find a compromise between the two positions. The next cycle of false teaching, this time growing up from within the ranks of the Protestant movement, involved a very sincere man by the name of James Arminius. Arminius was born in Uitwater in the Netherlands. He became a pastor of an Amsterdam congregation and a professor at the University of Leiden from 1603 until his death in 1609. During the course of his life, Arminius rejected many of the teachings of the Reformation and returned to the semi-Pelagian view of Rome. In 1610, one year after Arminius' death, his followers drafted five articles of faith based upon his teachings. These five points of what came to be called Arminianism stood in contradistinction to what the Church of Holland had been teaching since the Reformation. These five articles, also called the Remonstrance or Protest, were then presented to the Reformed Church. The Arminian party insisted that the Church's statements of faith, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism, be adapted to conform to the five points of Arminianism. In November of 1618, a national synod or council was convened in the city of Dort for the purpose of examining the views of the Arminian party. Eighty-four members and 18 civil commissioners, including 27 delegates from Germany, Switzerland, England, and elsewhere, were in attendance. From the first day until the synod's close in May of 1619, some 154 sessions were held. The result was an overwhelming rejection of the five points of Arminianism. Since the Arminian attack had been so focused and severe, the men who were part of the synod believed a mere rejection of the five points of Arminianism would be insufficient to stem the tide of error. They therefore responded to each of the five points in turn, formulating what has come to be called the five points of Calvinism. What the Synod of Dort did was to reaffirm the confessional statement that already existed in the Dutch Reformed Church, and they reaffirmed it in light of the particular objections that the Remonstrants had brought against it. It's known today as the five points of Calvinism, but Calvin didn't sit down one day and say, I'm going to write my theology in five points and then write out these five points. But the reason they came out as five distinct points was because it was in response to the objections of the Arminians or the, the Remonstrants. Dr. J.I. Packer, author of the classic work Knowing God, summarized the Arminian position as put forth by the Remonstrants. Number one, man is never so completely corrupted by sin that he cannot savingly believe the gospel when it's put before him. Number two, man is never so completely controlled by God that he cannot reject God's grace. Number three, election is as a result of God, looking down the quarters of time, foreseeing that a sinner will accept Christ. Therefore, God elects those who first elect him. Number four, Christ's death did not ensure the salvation of anyone, for it did not secure the gift of faith. For the remonstrance, there was no such gift. What it did was rather to create a possibility of salvation for everyone if they would only choose to believe. And number five, it ultimately rests with the believers to keep themselves in a state of grace by keeping up their faith. Those who fail here fall away and are lost. Dr. Packer concludes, Arminianism made man's salvation depend ultimately on man himself saving faith being viewed throughout as man's own work. In essence, Arminianism recaptured the synergistic position of semi-Pelagianism and Roman Catholicism, teaching that salvation is accomplished through the combined efforts of God, who takes the initiative, and man, who must respond, with man's response being the ultimate determining factor. God has provided salvation for everyone, but his provision becomes effective only for those who of their own free will choose to cooperate with him and accept his free offer of grace. At the crucial point, man's will plays a decisive role, the catalyst or active ingredient. 
Thus, man's good work, and not God's, determines who will be recipients of the gift of grace. The Synod of Dort, as we've seen, responded to the five points of the Arminian party with what is known today as the five points of Calvinism. We'll wait until the next section to examine each of these points in detail, but in essence they are as follows. Number one, total depravity in response to the Arminian view of free will. Number two, unconditional election in contradistinction to conditional election. Number three, particular, or what is commonly referred to as limited atonement in opposition to general or universal atonement. Number four, irresistible grace in reply to resistible grace. And number five, perseverance of the saints in answer to the idea that a saved man could be unsaved. In short, the leaders at the Synod of Dort, like Luther, Calvin, and Augustine, taught that salvation is accomplished by the almighty power of the triune God. The Father chooses or elects people to be saved. The Son redeems them through His cross. And the Holy Spirit makes Christ's death effective by bringing the elect to faith and repentance, thereby causing them willingly to believe the gospel. The entire process is the work of God and is by and through grace alone. Thus, God's grace and not man's good work determines who will be saved. The leaders assembled at Dort understood that the five points of Arminianism were on shaky ground, that if one point were proven wrong, the entire system would collapse. The Arminians were ejected out of the church. Over 300 ministers were expelled as a result of their disagreement with the doctrinal teaching of the Dutch church. That teaching was reformational theology or Calvinism as it is more popularly known. The Synod of Dort taught that salvation from beginning to end was a work of God's grace alone. They believed that Adam's fall had ruined the whole race and plunged man into spiritual death that entangled his will in bondage to sin and Satan. To teach that man could save himself by an exercise of his will apart from the grace of God, which is Pelagianism, or contribute to his own salvation by having man cooperate with the grace of God, which is semi-Pelagianism, was heresy a giant step away from the Reformation and back towards Roman Catholicism. The Reformers felt that if they acquiesced to the protests or the remonstrations of the uh, Arminians at that time, that in a very real way they would have been putting their feet back on a path to Rome. Now let me clarify that. I don't think any of them believed that Arminianism was or is today Roman Catholicism. We're talking about putting your feet on a path that goes in a certain direction. Now, the big difference between historic Arminianism and Roman Catholicism is that Arminianism does believe and affirms categorically the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That is, a, an orthodox Arminian believes that the grounds for his justification, for his salvation, is not his own righteousness, but the righteousness that has been won for him by the work of Jesus Christ. However, when you get down to the nitty-gritty and you push Arminianism to its logical conclusion, there is where you see the uh, extreme danger of slipping into a works righteousness.